Okay, we'll start again. Welcome everyone to Casey Cardinia Libraries. Tonight we are very fortunate to be once again hosting the wonderful Judy Nunn, who is here to tell us all about her new novel Showtime, which has just been released. This is Judy's 16th adult novel, which will take you from the cotton mills of England to the magnificent theatres of Melbourne on a scintillating journey through the golden age of Australian show business. There will be a giveaway of a copy of Showtime to some lucky person in our audience and details on how to win it will be in the chat section of this recording. If you have any questions to ask Judy, please pop them in the chat within Zoom and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And now I will pass you over to Judy. <laughs> hi, gang. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for turning up. Thanks, Janine. Uh, thanks, Courtney. Thanks, everybody. It's good to be back. Uh, I wish I was there in person so that I could hear the thunderous applause, it's the actor in me, but I mean, <laughs> feel all the warmth that I get when I when I work with you guys. So I'll miss that, but nevertheless, I hope we have fun. Uh, now, when I'm on my physical tours, as I did last time, I was at your gorgeous library, uh, I start with um, a, an audio, it just runs 40 minutes, a short audio, where I let somebody else tell you about my book. Uh, and I'll do that right now. I don't see why I should alter the whole opening format just because I'm not there in person. Uh, now, this, this person who will be telling you about my book will actually be my husband, Bruce Venables, gorgeous, extraordinary uh, actor and writer. And he makes these audios for me. And I, I love them because they put me in the mood and I believe they put the audience in the mood. So if you feel like it, just give in to your imagination, close your eyes and go with the flow. Okay, let's give it a burl and see if it works. If it doesn't, well, you know, we'll do something else. <laughs> My old man said, follow the van and don't dilly-dally on the way. Off went the van with me own packed in it. I followed on with me old cock linnet. But I dillied, I dallied, I dallied and I dillied. I lost me way and don't know where to roam. Cause I stopped off to have one at the old red tavern And I can't find my way home That particular song was written in 1919 just after the conclusion of the Great War. But it relates to a much earlier time. It's the story of a couple who lose their jobs and can't pay the rent and are forced to do a midnight runner. They get a van and pack their belongings but there's no room for the woman, and her husband tells her to follow the van. Unfortunately, she stops for a drink and loses her way. It was meant as a humorous look back at hard times in England during the second half of the 19th century, at the height of the Industrial Revolution, with its filthy mines, black smokestacks, undrinkable water, sickness and death. People were horrified by their living conditions and desperate to escape. The situation led to mass migration, especially to Australia, where gold strikes were weekly events, the air was fresh and clean, and newcomers could hope for a better life. Travelling circus stars Will and Max Worthing and their equally talented wives Mabel and Gertie were four such people who left for the land down under, and they are the principal players in Judy Nunn's latest novel, Showtime. From small beginnings, they created the Worthing Brothers family, which grew into one of the truly great Australian show business dynasties. Showtime is a story spread over four decades, concluding at the end of the Great War. Along the way, you'll meet the divine Dolores, interpretive dancer, Artie and Alfie, twins, acrobats, and fabulous magicians, Carlo and Rube, stars of the traveling boxing tents who go on to become entrepreneurs in their own right. Plus, Italian sopranos, snake charmers, jugglers, tigers, illusionists, and actors extraordinaire. 
And throughout your travels in Showtime, you'll also meet Emma. But that's me. That's me. That's me. Finally, here I am, at long last. Emma Jane Worthing. Max Worthing is my father, and Gertie Smead is my mother. Although everyone knows her as the divine Dolores, creator of the serpentine dance. I was born on February the 1st, 1901, only a month after Federation Day. Ma and Pa had, of course, been here for years before I came along, but I know the whole family history, which I'll reveal to you as we go along. Uh, oh, oh, where do I start? That's I... enough now, Em. What? Uh, oh. Oh, yes, of course. Sorry. You'll get your chance later in the book. Showtime paints a picture of one of Australia's most colourful periods, from the gold mining towns and the travelling shows that entertain them, to the major theatres of Melbourne and Sydney, where the theatrical managements fought to outdo each other by turning their travelling shows into huge theatrical events. Glitzy, glamorous, glittering extravaganzas, which they all invariably advertised as the greatest show on earth. Neither plague, nor smallpox, nor the First World War, nor the great Spanish flu pandemic that followed would slow the spread of Australian show business. Australia's master storyteller, Judy Nunn, will take you on a journey you won't ever want to end in her latest blockbuster, Showtime. Well, uh, if, um, I could hear it properly. I hope everybody else could. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, good, good on you, Janine. You're not it good. Uh, it's evocative, isn't it? it I, I find it so. Uh, he does a good job, you know. As I always say, I only marry talented men. Thank you, Brucey. Uh, but as you heard in the audio, uh, the, the, the goal... What happened? Uh, not only for the entire country, of course, as, you know, hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world uh, teamed into Melbourne from landing, you know, on boats and taking off to the gold fields. I mean, in those days of the 50s, 60s, uh, uh, Melbourne was the fastest growing, most cosmopolitan. Um, I've got a thing on my internet connection is unstable. Does that mean anything? No. I, don't, I don't need to worry about it. But anyway, yes, Melbourne, where of course, you guys all are, was the most cosmopolitan, fastest growing city in the whole of the world, known as Marvellous Melbourne all over the world. I mean, I could have thought of something a little bit more imaginative, but, you know, touch of alliteration, I suppose that's okay. But it was globally known as this extraordinary place. And indeed, when they were landed uh, on the other side of the river, um, there was a tent city set up to accommodate all these people who then headed off to the Victorian goldfields and out of the out of the very dust of the goldfields sprang up these glorious townships, uh, you know, Bendigo, Ballarat, Castlemaine, Maryborough, you name them, so many. And uh, very quickly they became solid towns. Beautiful, naturally, pubs. I mean, miners will always need a pub or two or three, um, and uh, and post offices, and inevitably a theatre. Because what happened uh, overseas, as everybody discovered, uh, Melbourne, uh, both in the UK and the United States, the entrepreneurs sat up and took notice. They all knew that where there were a, was a massive gathering of that huge size. Uh, people would seek entertainment. So the entrepreneurs quickly followed. They weren't necessarily coming for the gold. They were coming for the audiences, and they did. And they came in all varieties. I mean, bawdy, musical, burlesque, uh, vaudeville, um, variety eventually becoming a little more sophisticated, and including minstrelsy, which came very much from America. Uh, minstrels, blackface entertainment, which, of course, is a very dirty word today. As a matter of fact, I had to put in the front of the book a little uh, message from the author, 
same way, saying, uh, look, please don't get offended. Uh, we know this is a very bad thing today, performance, blackface and everything, of course. But um, in those days, it was a very, very popular form of entertainment throughout the United States, throughout Britain. Many performers headed to Britain, working on their variety circuit too, doing minstrelsy. And of course, they all headed to the goldfields and to Australia. What I find a rather interesting little, you know, note, side note on this is that with the blackface performers in minstrelsy, where they're performing these rather shocking, stereotypical uh, uh, caricatures of African-American people, although the word was never African-American then, you know, it was the Negro population, um, they, uh, they, there were many, many black Americans who were also employed in these shows. They came out and terrific dancers and singers and, and comedians, you know. And the amazing thing was they had to black their faces up to be as black as the white performers. Isn't that extraordinary? And I have one of the real characters uh, who came out here exactly along those lines, a bloke called Irving Sales. He was an immensely talented fellow in every level. He was also a great athlete, actually. And he settled in Melbourne and was a hugely successful entertainer, arriving with the minstrelsy, uh, then becoming literally working as a pair with another bloke and everything. And he had wonderful views on minstrelsy. I've put it in the book because he actually, I actually have the character in the book because he's so adorable. Uh, and uh, when asked, how do you feel about this? Do you not feel, you know, this is a bit of an insult to your people? He said, well, I don't know. I mean, if, you, if you're a fellow like me and you're blacking up to be this cartoon character of us and these black people are uh, taking the mickey out of their white plantation owners, et cetera, pretending to be, it's black people pretending to be white. And he said, and the white people are laughing because it's all so funny. Who do you think they're really laughing at, us? or the white plantation owners. I found that rather adorable. Uh, he became hugely successful at Irving Sales and he married a, 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 an Australian a white woman. I think she might have been of Irish background, but whatever. Anyway, and he stayed on in Australia. Great racist, uh, racist comment to be had here on top of that though, is in 1901, when the white Australia policy came into being, the, the first, the first, you know, major law passed by the new federation. It was actually called the Immigration Restriction Act of 1901, but very quickly became known throughout as the White Australia Policy. Um, and all of these wonderful black performers uh, lived a, a, a shocking existence then. They, they worried that they were going to be kicked out, so they had to stay pretty mum about being here. They certainly couldn't go home for a holiday, these successful performers. Um, and as minstrelsy slowly came out of favour, I don't, I don't think because people really woke up to the fact that it was a pretty insulting form of, you know, not everybody had Irving Sale's beautifully philosophical view of it. Um, but uh, it just sort of be stopped being the favourite flavour of the month, as happens in, you know, in everything, doesn't it? Um, uh, but they 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 couldn't they didn't dare go home for a holiday because they wouldn't be allowed back in, and so as minstrelsy faded, they ended up selling um, you know pie carts and cleaning streets and everything because, funnily enough, despite the racism in this country, their lives were still better in Australia than they were if they went home. So that's a comment on racism, I think. But anyway, so getting back to the book, the other great acts that came out, of course, were. Oh, they were exotic, they were silly, they were funny, they were... Uh, and as these theatres grew and Melbourne became the absolute mecca of theatre in the country, it, it way above Sydney, uh, and uh, suddenly it became very competitive. Sydney thought, oh, hang on, we better build our big theatres too. And, of course, we moved on to more sophisticated areas of entertainment. Uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's comic operas were hugely in, in vogue uh, and moving into Shakespeare and, uh, and Oscar Wilde and, uh, you know, musical comedies, The Merry Widow and stuff like that. Wonderful. But, but 
throughout the book, of course, as it said in the video, as Bruce was saying in the video, in the audio, sorry, um, the book covers quite a deal of historical territory. So the people working in the theatre are going through what the Joe Blows and everybody else are going through in Australia. They're living through, uh, well, in the bubonic plague known as the Black Death uh, in the early uh, 20th century, early 1900s. Um, uh, they're living through the huge depression as the whole of Australia is, how did theatre cope then? Uh, then through World War II, of course, uh, and many of the theatrical people, of course, are going off to fight in, in the war. And uh, when they came back, uh, it was really a, a heartbreaking thing that I discovered in research at the end of World War I, uh, that many of the returned soldiers uh, there was heaps of employment to be had, of course, because a whole generation of young men were off fighting in a war. And when these poor wounded men came back, uh, and despite all the work that should have been on offer, there were signs all over the place saying, returned soldiers need not apply, uh, no servicemen needed. Probably because half of them, being the terrible war it was, of course, with uh, you know heavy artillery and stuff like that, many of them, of course, were limbless. There were one-armed men and one-legged men, and uh, they didn't want to employ them. But uh, as I say in the book, uh, this didn't apply in the theatre. The theatre opened its arms to, well, certainly my Worthing brothers, and I believe it would have been the same throughout theatre, they said, uh, well, I mean, you know, you can always have a one-armed man being a runner between uh, backstage and front of house. We always need runners. And a one-legged man can sit on a stool and operate a spotlight, you know. Uh, so there's always been a great, uh, a great camaraderie and a great lack of judgment or criticism in the theatre. Uh, for instance, just going back briefly while I amble on, uh, with the race, racist, uh, racial and racist attitudes, um, nobody really cared who was black, white, brindle, where you came from. What The whole thing was talent. Have they got talent? Like Irving Sales had. Who, 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 what did it matter? Uh, and I cover this very much in the book too. So there's quite a lot said, as well as it being a gung-ho look at theatre in those days. Now, the amazing thing is, uh, as uh, a lot of word has been going around via my gorgeous publishers, uh, this celebrates my 30 years of storytelling, which is true. And over those 30 years, that's 16 books, two years a book, and it measures from the first book that was published, of course. So it's not 15 years, it's actually 15 books, actually 16. And the, the gorgeous Penguin House, Penguin Random House people brought out this gorgeous map. I want to share it with you. It'll probably flare and be, but see that? Isn't that divine? And until they brought out this map to promote my 30 years of storytelling, I didn't even know, to be quite honest, that I've set books in every state and every territory in this country. Um, I have to admit, with the exception of uh, the ACT, because I can't get inspired by Canberra, but everywhere else, yep, there's a book there. Uh, and people often ask about, of course, about inspiration. And I have to say, we, there are so many forms of inspiration when you look at the beautiful history of this country. I mean, to give a few examples, for instance, uh, territory I wrote set in the Northern Territory, that was inspired by Darwin itself. Uh, annihilated twice within 42 years, once by the Japanese bombs in 42 and then by Cyclone Tracy in 74. So that was the city itself. Now, another one might not be anything to do with the city, but it's a place where something, a, an actual event occurred. That one I would quote as Marilinga. That was set in South Australia. And that was where the secret nuclear testing ground was set up and nuclear bombs were detonated in our country, some of them greater kiloton energy than those that were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I mean, shocking. The country is still suffering, and most certainly our first Australians suffered abominably because they just said the land was deserted, which, of course, it wasn't. 
Uh, then the final one to quote as example might be not a particular that's heritage in the Snowy Mountains, not a particular uh, city, although very much placed in Kuma, and not a specific event, but a period uh, in our history that was very, very life-changing to this country. And that was the building of the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme with the huge uh, uh, influx of, of uh, migrants at the end of World War I, sowing therefore the seeds the first seeds of multiculturalism in this country. So as you can see, I've gone, uh, well, uh, if, uh, my great love these days is writing historically based fiction where my real, my fictional characters mingle with real characters and live through these periods that are very real in our history and show us the times that, you know, that have affected us and that we've lived through. Uh, which is really funny when I think about it, because my first two books were very, very much about show business. The first one, Glitter Game, was set uh, in television land, you know, and <laughs> I, I know and knew then television land, particularly of those times, you know, it was published in 91. Uh, and the second book was based, as I promised my publishers, it would be uh, in specifically in the theatre, which was my true love, before television claimed me. It was a very different book, a thriller set over two generations, not a classic thriller, but it ended up having a thriller aspect. And then by the time I got to the third book, I know the publishers were very keen for me to place this around movie making, which also I knew a fair bit about as an actor. But I thought, no, I really want to spread my wings, go broader. So I started out with... Uh, the ancestors of my one day to become movie mogul coming out on the bar Henrietta and settling in the Barossa Valley nearby Dr. Penfold at the Grange where they became winemakers. Well, this was a little bit exhausting. I had to then research uh, viticulture and oenology, uh, South Australia in the 1950s. Well, I found it fascinating uh, I bumped into all this stuff. I thought, gee, I didn't know that. I, I called it Araluan. I didn't know that Araluan was an Indigenous word that related to water. And depending upon which language group you were talking about, uh, and it could mean the place where water lilies meet if you're inland, you know, where if you're talking about an estuary area, more coastal, it could be where the waters meet. Little things like that you bump into and you think, that's really interesting. So my people called their vineyard Araluan. Uh, so I was hooked from that moment on. And I haven't looked back. I've written historically based fiction, um, very different books each time, depending on what particular aspect sort of uh, inspires me. And yet now, after all of these 30 years, I'm still writing historically but I'm marrying it back with my original first great love, which is the theatre. So this time, instead of it being a lovely satire like the glitter game about television or, or uh, you know, sticking to the KISS principle of theatre, keep it simple, stupid, uh, you know, write about what you know and I knew the theatre. This time I'm rediscovering the theatre that I did not experience myself as a young person treading the boards. And for the first 20 years of my professional life, I was working in the theatre. This is a different theatre because it's from the 1980s following the gold rush when my Worthing family, the Worthing brothers and their wives, and Carlo and Rube, who worked in boxing tents, uh, and they come out here and go on to become entrepreneurs. Uh, that's obviously way before my time. And we go up, as I say, through to the end of World War II, following uh, these two great entrepreneurial uh, pairs and, and the theatres they set up and the companies they set up way before my time. But what I did bump into was uh, a beautiful familiarity. Uh, I really did discover, and it was very fortuitous because um, I, I felt I'd come home in a way uh, as I'm certainly due to COVID, of course, I wasn't allowed to travel.
travel as much as I would not, well, at all. And I would normally travel and 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 talk to people in wherever the book is placed. And fortunately, I've worked a lot in Melbourne, in uh, in the great theatres of Melbourne, beautiful theatres. I've worked in Melbourne, and I've worked in television in Melbourne for years. So I felt at home there. And I've also worked in some of the goldfields uh, towns, certainly appearing on book tours. So that was a big help there. But what I discovered generally is that the essence of theatre itself and the people who inhabit the theatre, they haven't really changed all that much, funnily enough. Even back in those bawdy old vaudeville days, there were still, there were always superstitions. There were ghosts. There will always be theatre ghosts. I have two that feature in the book, real ghosts. I mean, really documented ghosts. Just depends if you believe that they're there. I do. I haven't personally seen them, although I have worked the Theatre Royal Hobart where there's a very famous ghost, Fred, and my friend Jackie Weaver has seen him and swears to it, and many people have. I did two seasons there and I didn't see him. I feel really deeply deprived. Um, and there's the gorgeous Princess Theatre in Melbourne, which has the most famous ghost of all, Frederick Federici. And, uh, oh, I've got to tell you this one. I love a little digress now and then. Uh, but he actually, he was, uh, although the, the name is Italian, he actually came out from England. He was, uh, he was a tenor, opera singer, and he was singing Mephistopheles. And the final note of the opera is Mephistopheles disappearing uh, through the trapdoor of the theatre, going to hell, of course, uh, with Faust. And he sings the last note of the opera. And Federici did this, sang the last note, and then he disappeared through the trapdoor, going out. And uh, he was only 37 years old, and he had a heart attack. And he hit the basement, and he was virtually dead. Uh, and he was supposed to, of course, scupper up after that and join the rest of the cast in the curtain call. And the rest of the cast all swore that he was there in the curtain call. They, they, they were holding his hand. They were taking their final bars. He wasn't. He was dead in the basement, as they discovered later. And they brought him back up to the green room and tried to revive him. But he didn't. He died. And his ghost haunts the Princess Theatre, uh, supposedly to this day. And for many years after that, uh, and this was, I think, in 1904. And for many years after that, uh, they kept every opening night uh, a, a vacant seat for him in the front row of the dress circle. So all of these things abound, as they did then. They still do today. The superstitions, of course. Uh, I mean, don't mention the Scottish play, which I think most people know that that means Macbeth, but they don't perhaps know why. Uh, unless you're actually performing Macbeth, don't ever mention not only the title, but any quote from Macbeth anywhere in the theatre, because it will it will be the death of the show, uh, because uh, evidently uh, Shakespeare wrote in the Witches on the on the Heath, the double, double, boil and trouble, eye of Newt and all of that, uh, was actually based upon a real spell. And productions of Macbeth have been, you know, hugely, you know, disaster ridden. Uh, other little ones like, you know, don't, if you're taking flowers backstage, don't put, don't have lilies in there because lilies are associated with funeral wreaths. That would be in the death of the show. So a friend of mine, I was actually doing a show, I was in Melbourne at the Comedy Theatre. Oh, God, what happened to the comedy? They should never have mowed that down. The Odd Couple, it was a J.C. Williamson's production. Somebody came backstage and there were lilies in the wreath and uh, the bloke, he was to a bloke, I won't say who, um, and he just threw them straight out the window, which seemed very insulting. He said, no, lilies, lilies in the dressing room, no. And the whistling, no whistling still, uh, it still applies as a superstition, no whistling. The reason for that was because uh, with the, the lowering of huge, hefty backdrops and counterweights to, you know, and all of that, there was lots of ups and downs with very heavy material from uh, stagehands in the wings and those operating from the flies, that is the area above the stage. And they would, they would communicate via whistles. So if you just ran around whistling and they thought that was a signal, bang, you know, you get something very heavy on your head. So all of these things still exist. And they did all those years ago. So there was a wonderful, wonderful feeling of familiarity. And I think above all, the one that exists most strongly did then and does uh, today, is the adage, you know, the show must go on. 
And the awful things that can happen on stage that people live through, get over. I mean, God almighty, if, you know, an ASM assistant stage manager hasn't placed the revolver in the drawer that you have to pull open and take the gun out and shoot somebody, you know, an actor has to just take, bang, uh, you know, it'll, it'll bring the audience unstuck. But and particularly if it's a very, you know, dramatic moment, it's unfortunate, but you don't sort of stop, you just soldier on. And I think the greatest example of that would have to be uh, the Windmill Theatre, gorgeous theatre. I actually did an interview there ages ago in the 90s. Uh, yeah, and I was interviewed there. I thought, God, this is the windmill, how amazing. Um, and the Windmill Theatre in Great Windmill Street in the middle of the West End, uh, their great boast was throughout the whole of the Blitz, throughout all the bombing of London, they never closed. Uh, that the show went on regardless. They would state to the audience when the sirens sounded, anybody wanting to leave the theatre, feel free. But uh, the show would go on. And then they'd race down to the basement and uh, hover there. But uh, their great big claim in neon lights out the front of the theatre, I remember it was still there, I'm sure, when I was there. It said, uh, we never closed in neon lights. It's what's so very tragic at the moment, actually, with the, the COVID that, that so many, think, well, they can't. I mean, this is simply, we're living through a pandemic. Uh, but uh, the ghost light remains on in the theatre. Tragic when a theatre has to go dark, so they don't let it go dark. They keep what they call a ghost light shining, so the theatre lives. Uh, right. Well, now, I think, uh, uh, well, amongst all of these in the early days, these crazy things that happened, uh, that shows that came out here, uh, there was a stage when exotic animals were huge. The, the Fuller family, a dynastic family, very much upon whom my Worthing family is based upon, actually, um, uh, they actually had a seal act where this great big thing would come out of this great big tank of water and they'd have seals, uh, you know, which is extraordinary. Um, so uh, I'm going to read a little bit now, if that's okay. And um, it relates to this. This is, uh, this is Carlo and Rube's. Carlos, big show bonanza. Now, the year is 1899, and the big show bonanza is currently performing at the Princess Theatre in Melbourne, okay? It's just before Frederick Federici uh, met his grisly end. Well, not grisly, he just had a heart attack, didn't he? It was very noble end, actually. Um, but anyway, so this is 1899, okay? The great Goldini's performance was coming to its conclusion and the grand finale was to be an illusion of vast proportion. So vast, in fact, that it warranted the return of the show's master, Carlo himself. And now, ladies and gentlemen, he proclaimed, a drum roll having heralded both his appearance and the import of his announcement, the denouement for which you have all been waiting. The disappearing tiger. Everything you have read and heard of the great Goldini's mastery is about to unfold before you right here on this very stage. Behold. Another drum roll as he gestured to the OP side. That's opposite prompt. All three of them gestured in unison. Carlo, the great Goldini, and the beautiful Cassandra. While from the wings, two stagehands pushed out a trolley upon which sat a large cage. The tiger, Carlo bellowed dramatically and perhaps a little unnecessarily as a wave of gasps rippled through the audience like wind on water. Inside the cage was indeed a tiger, prowling restlessly, unsettled by the lights and the drum roll and the general commotion. The tiger, Carlo continued seamlessly, which through the mastery of the great Goldini will disappear before your very eyes. Thence to be returned, dramatic pause for effect, as a kitten. He bashed the front of the cage with his hand, a signal for the animal to growl and slack back with its giant paw, either due to its training or its irritation. No one was sure, least of all Carlo. 
or for that matter, the Goldinis, who had bought the beast from a circus that was going bust. They didn't know its background. The big cat obeyed, baring its teeth with a snarl, whacking its paw against the bars, and another ripple of gasps, very audible this time, ran through the audience. A tiger turned into a kitten. Carlo emphatically enthused, pacing downstage, arms outstretched, embracing the whole of the house. A feat never before witnessed on any stage in the world. The music was about to strike up and Carlo was about to leave the stage to the Goldinis and their mime and the impressive display of special effects. But that was as far as he got. There was not a sound from the orchestra pit and the gasps had become far more than a ripple. Both the musicians and the audience were alarmed and with just cause. Behind him, the gate of the cage had slowly swung open and the, far, the tiger stood there facing directly out front, surveying the freedom that beckoned. The Goldinis posted either side of the cage as they were, exchanged looks of horror. Neither could move, husband and wife simultaneously rooted to the spot. Then the tiger stepped out from the cage, negotiating the one foot drop from the trolley with threatening elegance. The beautiful Cassandra gave a terrified scream and headed for the wings OP, while the great Goldini raced for the prompt side, equally terrified but cursing his wife. He'd never wanted to do this trick in the first place, but she'd insisted exotic animals were the latest thing and the bigger the better. Cassie could be so dumb. Carlo turned to see what all the ruckus was about. He froze. The tiger was standing centre stage, its eyes following the direction from which the screams were still audible. The screams stopped. Someone had shut Cassie up. The tiger turned its attention to the next distraction, which was Carlo. It took a step towards him, then paused, yellow eyes unblinkingly fixed upon this creature of interest. Then in the front row of the stalls, people were starting to panic. They were getting up out of their seats, prepared to flee. Then, no, don't go, Carlo said the voice of calm, but also the voice of compelling authority. There's no cause for panic, I assure you. It's all part of the act. And they believed him. They sat back down in their seats. The musicians in the orchestra pit knew better. Being the professionals they were, however, they did not disrupt the performance, choosing instead to quickly and silently steal away. Carlo was left to put on a show. He faced the tiger. Here, kitty, he said. Here, kitty, kitty. And incredible as it was, there were laughs from the house. Nervous laughs, perhaps, but laughs nonetheless. So far, so good, he thought. Adrenaline coursing through his veins. He had them under control. He took off his tail coat and holding it out in front of him like a cape, adopted a matador pose. Toro, he said, Toro, Toro. He didn't dare jiggle the coat as a matador might his cape for fear of agitating the beast, but this was showtime. He had to make things entertaining. The tiger, totally focused upon Carlo and perhaps intrigued by the coat, started to pad very slowly towards him, intent upon investigating. Carlo equally slowly backed away. Toro, Kitty, Toro, he said. The mention of Kitty didn't raise a laugh this time, the audience holding its collective breath, not daring to break the moment. As if in slow motion, man and beast circled the stage, Carlo cautiously backing, the tiger following. Or was it stalking? Was it at any moment about to pounce? At one point, Carlo, in his determination to entertain, gave the coat a small jiggle and the tiger swiped a huge paw at it, a shared gasp from the audience. A very taut moment. No, he decided he wouldn't try that again. 
But the tiger did seem intrigued by the coat, Carlo realised. Tigers and kittens are very closely related, he said, keeping his voice calm in order not to excite the beast, but making sure at the same time it reached well out into the auditorium. The acoustics at the Princess Theatre were excellent, as he knew. They're all just the same, really, he went on. It's only a matter of size, wouldn't you agree? Here, Kitty, he called once again, the coat still held out at arm's length. Here, Kitty, Kitty. No laugh, but he hadn't expected there would be. The circle was nearly completed now. They were back to the cage. Beside him was the open gate. Did he dare? He backed a step or two further. The tiger was beside the open gate now. Yes, he decided. He did. Carlo jiggled the coat more vigorously this time, and as the tiger once again swiped at it, he quickly pulled his arms into his chest, the animal's paw missing him by inches. Then, in one swift action, he hurled the coat into the cage and stood facing the tiger, wondering which option would find favour. What's it to be, he thought, the coat or me? But as fate decreed, the tiger automatically followed the source of its interest, the coat. Its circus trainer had used a cape, which the animal had always found irritating. With a snarl, it leapt into the cage. Carlo slammed the gate closed, giving the bars a brief rattle to ensure the catch had firmly locked, then whirled about to face the audience. Olay, he said, which was another bullfighting term he'd heard somewhere. Good kitty. Adopting full showmanship pose, he again triumphantly embraced the house. The tiger did not exactly disappear, I grant you, he announced. But as you can see, it did become a kitten. Beat that, he thought. And he took his bows to thunderous applause, while behind him the tiger now slumped on its belly, ripped into the tailcoat, tearing it to shreds. Backstage... The adrenaline having instantly deserted him, Carlo threw up into a fire bucket, which I think sort of demonstrates the uh, the show must go on. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you, Janine. Yes, that's the end for me. We can um, perhaps go to if there's any Q and A or whatever you reckon. Yes, we do have some questions, Judy. Um, Marie has asked. Judy, when doing your research for Showtime, is the early travelling carnival based on any show in particular? Oh, no. Uh, no. Uh, they're based on all the shows that that would have happened. And, I mean, really, it was... Uh, <laughs> they had some amazing, appalling acts, actually. Uh, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't... Uh, well, am I allowed to talk? They had fartas and belchers. I put that in the book. There was a very, very famous French uh, performer called Le Petamain. That was his stage name. He was Joseph... Uh, forgot, is that terrible? Uh, yes. Uh, and um, in the late 19th century, he was hugely famous and he could actually ingest air through his uh, anus and through his anal sphincter muscles. He could uh, play tunes. He appeared in full evening dress and top hat and uh, he could play tunes. And uh, I have a, 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 he preferred to call himself a flatulist by the way. Uh, but I have a fighter there in my book who is based upon the better man and he, he could also belch because there were belchers too who could actually ingest the air and then release it through their use of their esophageal muscles um, and he used to uh, he used to belch God Save the Queen which meant he always had a standing ovation and he could fart uh, uh, Strauss waltzes and people would get up and uh, waltz in the aisles. So, I mean, look, nothing was sacred. Everything was up for grabs. So I, I can't say I based my touring company on any specific company. It's an amalgamation of all these weird things they did. Okay. Um, Chris has asked, out of all the titles you've written, Judy, do you have a personal favourite? Yeah, I do get asked that. I'm sure most authors do. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. But, I, I mean, like, 
people with a number of children, they always get asked, do you have a favourite? And mums will always go, oh, of course not. I love them all equally, uh, which is a lie. Um, <laughs> uh, but in all honesty, I have to say, no, I don't have a favourite. Uh, every time I'm working on a novel, that's my favourite. I get, I get absolutely, you know, obsessed and I get so excited. I certainly know there are holes in every novel I write. There, there are holes in everybody's novel, I'm quite sure. So I, 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 I know the ones that I think are, are better written. I always love hearing which, are, which novels are people's favourites. Um, but I, I don't, honestly, I have to be quite honest, I don't have a favourite child among my novels. That's okay. Um, Linda has asked, Judy, how much time does it take you to research the events for your novels? Oh, I certainly take, I, I research continuously while I'm writing. Um, I mean, I read voraciously all the books that would pertain. I, I always get actually this great here, great big round of applause for you guys. Whenever I go to a place that I'm setting a book, first place I go to is the library. Yay! <laughs> Yay! We love libraries uh, uh, because, A, the librarians will know which specific book to put me in touch with. Otherwise, if you listen to everybody else, uh, you'll have a pile of books this big, you'll let it run, running around. So the librarians will select for me the book. And also, invariably, in, in regions, uh, particularly, you know, uh, far distant regions, the librarians are either local historians themselves, they know the place so well, or they'll certainly know who the local historians are. So they'll put me in touch with the right people. So I always go field research to where I'm basing the novel. Uh, and that will be oh, several trips, not for great lengths of time, but a couple of trips at least. Then I'll come back and write up all the notes and the interviews that I had with people. Uh, then I'll be reading books madly. So there'll be three months of that, at least, before I start. Uh, then as I'm, as I'm writing, I've marked all of these books and I'll be, you know, reminding myself of all the stuff that I... So it's, I'm researching for literally the, the full two years, well, the full 18 months while I'm actually writing the book. But the field research would be, and the, uh, the before I start, the book itself will be a good three months. Hmm. Now, Chris has asked, can you name some other authors that you admire? Oh, there are so many authors I admire, but I don't follow any one particular author specifically. Uh, I did. I did have a big crush on uh, uh, Lionel Shriver's books for a while because I found her so gorgeously kinky. Uh, some I absolutely adored. Some I I thought, oh, yeah, but you're still you. You're so you're so mm. I, very psychologically. You know, she really gets in the heads of this. I liked her, uh, but there are you know there are uh, so many books that I deeply admire. Um, you know, I mean, I just adored recently, and I'm reading his latest, Amor Tales. Um, a gentleman in Moscow, and I'm currently reading his uh, latest Lincoln Highway. Um, but uh, and I loved Richard Flanagan's Narrow Road to the Deep North. Uh, wasn't as absolutely keen on his next. Also, I don't follow any specific writer, but I love great books, and there are many great books that I've loved over the years. Many. That's good. Now Sylvia has asked. Judy, you were a great actress. It was a shame to see you leave our screens and theatres, but what inspired you to become an author and where do you get your ideas for each new novel? <laughs> the idea is one I always have, very cheeky, I get facetious and I'd say, I have this lovely little Chinese herbalist who lives a few blocks from me and, you know, the first Thursday of every month I go and buy a little bottle of inspiration <laughs> Uh, you know, which is, I, I, I don't mean to be rude, I'm just making a joke of it, because it is actually an impossible question to answer definitively. There are so many different areas, as I said, when I was, you know, looking at this map in this gorgeous program that, that the publishers did for me, it could be a place, it could be a happening, it could be a, it could be a little snippet I've read in a newspaper somewhere, you know. But um, the inspiration to leave acting and take up writing, I was doing both at the same time for quite a long time. I mean, while I was doing Home and Away, I mean, by the time I left that show, I had had five books published. So I, I think I, was, I actually, I, I love writing. I never set out or embarked upon becoming, you know, a best-selling novelist, as it were, which I absolutely adore. Uh, but um, it, that happened a bit by mistake. Uh, but I was very fortunate because having five books already published, 
uh, while I was earning a decent living working in television meant that by the time I came out the other side of that area of my career, I had a, I had a readership, I had a following. So it was much easier for me than somebody putting their first book out and hoping that that's going to lead to a livelihood. It takes a number of books before you can say, well, I think I can earn a living doing this, you know. Mm. A bit of luck thrown in along the line, I think. Oh, yeah. Now, Marie has asked, did any particularly adverse events happen to you while performing in the theatre? Oh, yes. Oh, gosh. Oh, let me count the ways. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'll tell you one beautiful example. I was doing a play called After the Fall. It was in Sydney at the Independent Theatre. I was 19 years old at the time. And it's, uh, it's a play by Arthur Miller, unashamedly based upon his marriage to uh, Marilyn Munro. Uh, he was criticised greatly for it, and I think rightfully so too, actually. Uh, and he's such a magnificent playwright, of course, but it wasn't his finest. But anyway, the set is designed to be Quentin, the Arthur Miller character, to be the central character's uh, mind. And it's based on all of these various levels, meaning the levels of his mind, you know. And, uh, and I'm playing this young love from ages ago in the back of his mind. And I have to be up on this top rostrum about nine feet above the stage and I'm holding my hand up and I'm going, I'll always love you, Quentin, always, always. And I'm backing, backing, backing. <laughs> I'm receding from his memory, you know. Well, I backed too far and I felt over the other side of the rostrum. <laughs> uh, so the audience didn't see me because, of course, I fell backstage, but by golly, they heard me. Almighty oh, crash. I'm very lucky I didn't break my back. And I, I thought it's a very funny story when you think of the title of the play, After the Fall. <laughs> True. <laughs> now, Linda has asked, I think this is the last question, would you like to see your books made into movies and maybe star in them? Oh, I'd love to see my books made into movies. You know, they'd have to be pretty big movies. They're pretty big books. So, you know, come on, George Lucas, Mr Spielberg, <laughs> Mr Cameron, please, you know, sort of fight for the rights. I have sold the rights of a number of movies, but, uh, I mean, you know, a number of books for movie rights. But, I mean, they do that all the time, producers. They'll they'll buy up. The, and this, I believe me, this wasn't Mr Cameron or Mr Lucas or Mr Spielberg. But, um, you know, you sell the rights for, you know, not very much. Uh, they sit on them for two years and they do that for a number of books that are pretty hot at the time. And, you know, believe, seeing is believing and all that. Of course, I would love to see them made into movies. So if there are any movie, you know, makers watching, yeah, please ring my agent. Um, but uh, as for starring in them myself, no, I don't really want to see myself up on that big screen. No. Maybe, maybe even a cameo role. A lot of authors do that. They have a little cameo role. Really? Yes. Uh, Rosalie Ham, who wrote The Dressmaker, has a cameo role in that movie. I did read that too. I, I, I love that film. I, I enjoyed that film very much. Uh, tell her I'm terribly sorry. I'm afraid I haven't read the book. Uh, but uh, which uh, and I always prefer to read a book before seeing a film. Uh, but I thought they they did they did a good job for her. Mm. So yeah, well, good for her. No, no, I don't think I'll say please let me be Mr. Hitchcock in the background of some scene. No. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Okay, well, I think we've um, we've just about come to the end of our show. <clears throat> oh, now, don't forget to be in the running to win a copy of Judy's new novel, Showtime. You need to send the answer to the question, how many books has Judy written? I think what's been mentioned a number of times tonight, so that should be an easy one. The email address is in the chat, and I'll read it out too. It's it's the letters of in a nook with a book, so I-A-N-W-A-B at cclc.vic.gov.au. Entries will close at midnight on Friday the 8th of October and we'll advise the winner by email with details on how they can collect their book. Judy, we cannot thank you enough. It has been so entertaining. You always are entertaining. And we hope to goodness next book around. Oh, I must ask you, have you got another one in the works at the I moment? Don't. No, I'm keeping my head in showtime while I'm doing the tour, you know, as I always do. I, I just want to keep, you know, living in, in this. Um, 
but sometimes I have an idea vaguely wrapping around. This time I don't actually, but I will have. So hopefully next time in two years' time, I'll be able to be in your gorgeous library in person. Lovely. Thank you so much once again. Well, thank you. I had great fun. Thanks, girls. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I had a great time. Thanks.